One, two, three, go. This is the Seat Lombard Rolls 5. This is a group of paper circuits created by Peter Blasser for what he calls a primordial drum machine. I'm making a video on this because this instrument is a really cool project and I haven't seen many videos about it. So I thought I'd give the internet a, a, an explanation on what this instrument is and how this instrument works. I'll walk you through each part of the circuit from the top down to the bottom. These paper circuits, which I've got right here, the link will be down below. These were taken by a man in China named Meng Qi, who turned these into one unified circuit board, complete with his favorite mods to add to everything. And we're on like the, I think this is the fifth or the sixth revision. And this is like a beautiful black matte circuit board. And here, I'll show you the back here so you can see what it actually looks like on the underside. As you can see on the front here, we've got the control mechanisms, basically just a bunch of potentiometers, a ton of uh, these touchable banana jacks, which are really cool. And it actually came with the circuit board. Uh, so that was a nice surprise. And, you know, power and audio input and output. Um, very basic. There's not a whole lot to control. And on the underside here, here's the circuitry. We've got the Rolzer at the very top. We've got the four AV dogs right underneath there. Then we've got the two ultrasound filters and the gongs at the very bottom. For this particular build, I used mostly uh, film capacitors. I don't remember why I did that. I guess something in me said, hey, filters sound better with film capacitors, and then I stuck with it. It sounds really good, but I've also done another build where I used specifically, uh, like, multi-layer and uh, ceramic capacitors, uh, that worked absolutely fine too. So the Rolls-5 is intended to be a primordial drum machine. And what this means is that it sort of creates drum machine-like functionality without the typical latchings of the drum machine. For example, if I were to pull out something like a, a Volca Beats, with the Volca Beats, you've got a bunch of different audio circuitry, right? Bass drum, snare, toms and your hi-hats, all of which have their own analog circuitry. And then to activate them, you have these, these sequencers. In this case, this is a microcontroller sequencer, but other times you'll have like, I don't know, 4017 with a bunch of switches or that type of thing. And basically you hit the trigger, you, you plan the triggers out, and when the triggers pass, they uh, activate the sound. So because of the way these CMOS chips work, you have very predictable patterns, which often are divisible by two. These are de designed to, to create music the way that we expect music to be created. Because everything's on a 16-step pattern, um, you can expect that you're going to get 4-4 four, four the vast majority of the time. And on top of that, you can silence things really easily, right? So for example, I've got my bass drum here, and if I go into step mode, I can see that I have the particular subdivisions of those 16 steps. They're already decided in advance so that the drum is only triggered on those steps. Simple, easy to understand, repeatable patterns. That is what we generally expect from a drum machine. Now, the Rolzer, on the other hand, is a completely different animal. A good way to imagine what's going on with the Rolzer is to imagine the game lights out. You turn one light out, and then the lights right directly next to it, they, they switch their polarity. So if you have a left and a right light that are off, and the center light is on, when you turn that center light off, the left and right lights turn on. That's exactly what's going on here, except it's happening entirely using transistors and voltage. You have capacitors that you can assign to each one of these nodes, and that controls the speed at which the polarity changes. Where things get interesting is patching them together, because you have this extra voltage that is like injected into the circuits. So all of a sudden you have this completely different dynamic going on. And to make things even weirder, you have odd rolls. So if you can imagine, you're at this 5, this 5 switches on, 
it turns this one off. But then this one over here at the beginning of the five tries to turn on. And then you've got two ons that are connected to each other. So it gets glitchy real fast. And as some people have said, it basically makes fart noises. Very expensive fart noises. So that's the Rolzer. Deceptively simple. It takes a lot of practice, especially with uh, the particular values that you choose. For my build, uh, they Mengchi set this up so that you can like socket things at the top if you buy like two by three socket headers. Um, I decided to hard to actually solder them in place. I found that every time I tried to move a cable, knocking them out of place and then losing the rhythm or not even knowing if it was working properly was just it was not my bag. So these are the AV dogs. Let's say I take a pulse out and I'll put it in here. I know that the undulation decay is high on here. Rule number one of demonstrating a synthesizer. Plug it in. So you've got a uh, undulation feedback control and a pitch control on the very surface. So if I pull this out, it does the full decay and then you hear like this, this little uh, return coming back in at the very end. So you've got four of these going along, uh, going along the top. Each has a Harry capacitor and a couple of variable resistors. I tried this out with one of the variable resistors on each one, and I highly recommend it if you're going to build your own. Use a trimmer. It's really easy to tie the middle pin to one of the outer ones and then just solder the two pins in place like a normal resistor, and it gives you a lot more modability without requiring you to, like, change things in the middle of the performance. I find that that's, it, that can be really distracting. And just using trimmers, we've already got it down here for the gongs, which I'll show you in a bit, but it, it just turned out to be a really good idea. Beneath that, we have the ultrasound filters. I don't know how to explain this. <laughs> so essentially, it's a filter that's tied to an ultrasonic frequency. So what this means is you can take a pulse in, and you can get these, like, filter pulses, essentially. And then as you turn it up, turn up the filter cutoff, it starts going up to an ultrasonic range, and I, I think, and then that produces, uh, yeah, you can hear that higher tone coming down. That essentially produces heterodyning, which creates a lower frequency underneath the frequencies at the very top. So you've got four of these, essentially, inputs. And they sound pretty cool with these uh, with these pulses, but what really separates this from the other instruments is that you can you it, it's just it's a filter, it's just an ultrasonic filter. So anything you put in there is going to have a really unusual effect. So remember how I said these odd nodes were glitchy? Yeah, this is how glitchy they are. Yeah, baby. Let's get more of that going on here. All right. At the very bottom, we've got gongs. Um, gongs, to me, sound more like toms. Let me take one of my large cables here, and we're going to plug that in. So you've got a cutoff, and this is supposed to be a subdivision of the uh, the pulse going in. It's not working too well for me, and I think that's because I screwed something up on the build. Because all you've got is the decay and this subdivision on the panel itself, on the underside there's a couple of trimmers that allow you to control the pitch of each gong, which is really helpful for uh, you know making them sound different. So as you can see here, this is kind of my, my low tom. Got a higher tom over there. And there's my like bass tom. So that one's really soft. I need to figure out why that's acting that way. So 
it's a really glitchy instrument. It's easy to uh, to run into issues, uh, which is why I highly recommend it to not be your first build. Let's explore what happens when you start patching things with multiple nodes. And I'm going to take this out and put this into a filter. I think that's the most obvious demonstration of what these sound like. Yikes. All right, let me get another one. All right, so as you can tell, Oh, yeah, there's one jack I didn't mention. We've got a ground jack here. I don't really know how to explain what it does. All I know is that it has a tendency to break some of the connections for the loops. And that can change the dynamic of some things. So now that I've got that silenced, let's see what happens if I connect that to this one. Wow, yeah, it stopped the uh, cycle entirely. <laughs> Ta da! If you like what I'm doing, give me a like, give me a subscription. I'm planning on doing a couple more of these uh, Meng Chi Seattle Lombard circuit boards in the near future. And maybe some other things if I feel up to it. So, cheers. Thanks for watching. So, at the very top here, we have what are called the rolls. Um, the, literally, the rolls are the namesake of the rolls five. Um, this was later rolled out 